In North America, July and August are holiday months. Most schools and colleges are not in session then. Families look for activities to keep the children amused. Although not all workers get a full two months of holidays, most people take a holiday in the summer. The summer begins with a national holiday. In Canada, July 1st is Canada Day. In the USA, July 4th is Independence Day. A lot of families are soon on the road. Some travel to cottages by the lake, some go sightseeing or camping. In Canada, especially, the summers are short, so people try to make the most of them. In much of Canada and parts of the northern USA are woodlands dotted with lakes. These regions of rocks, rivers, pine trees, and wild animals are not usually suitable for farming. However, they are ideal places to spend a summer holiday. They are far from the cities. The woods are quiet and peaceful. People fish, go boating or swimming, have barbecues outside, or play outdoor sports. Some people spend their whole summer at the cottage, others go for a week or two. City people who don't have a cottage like to go to parks and swimming pools in the city. If they are near a lake or ocean, they may go there for the day. Many museums, libraries, and art galleries have programs for children in the summer. Swimming is probably the favorite summer sport. It feels wonderful on a very hot day to jump into the cool water. Swimming is also excellent exercise. Besides swimming, baseball and football are also popular in the summer. Spending an afternoon or evening at a baseball game is a favorite summer pastime. Summer is also a favorite time to catch up on reading. Stories of adventures and love novels are favorite light reading. But summer is especially a time for traveling across the country. Some people have a camper or trailer that they can live in. Some stay in campgrounds and sleep in tents. Others stay at hotels or motels, while others rent cottages or cabins for a week or two. Most trips are by car. Many people visit national parks and other wildlife areas. Of course, trips along the ocean and the lakes are favorites. Along the Atlantic Ocean, the coasts of New England and Canada's maritime provinces are especially popular. On the Pacific Coast, tourists travel from California all the way up to Alaska. Boat cruises along the shores of British Columbia and Alaska are especially popular. Of course, some people find it most relaxing just to stay at home. Others cannot afford to travel. If you have an air conditioned house with a television, video player, CD player, and computer, then it can be very pleasant to stay at home. A lot of new movies are released at the theaters in the summer. Air conditioned theaters with new movies and lots of pop and popcorn are favorite summer places. After two months of summer activities, Most people are ready to go back to school and work, but they usually have lots of happy memories to take back with them. Pocahontas and John Smith In 1606, King James of England approved the establishment of two colonies along the eastern coast of America. The northern colony in Maine lasted only a year. The southern one at Jamestown in Virginia became England's first permanent settlement in America. In 1607, the Virginia Company sent 104 settlers to Virginia. The settlers lived in tents all summer. By September, more than 60 were dead because they lacked good food or water. The leaders of the colony were not energetic and did little to make the settlers find food. One member of the company, Captain John Smith, was determined that the colony would survive. Smith pressured the colonists to build huts, a storehouse, and a church. He made daring trips to Indian villages, demanding that they give the settlers food in return for beads and copper. He threatened settlers who were trying to leave the colony and go back to England. On one of his trips to the interior, Indians attacked John Smith. They killed his two companions, but captured him alive. He was taken first to the local chief. This chief was impressed by Smith's compass and spared his life. His captors dragged Smith from village to village. He finally arrived at the town belonging to Powhatan. Powhatan was a great chief for all of the tribes in that region. 
Powhatan and his advisers talked about what to do with Smith. Suddenly Smith was dragged forward, and his head was pushed against a stone. The warriors raised their clubs to kill Smith. Then Pocahontas, who was Powhatan's twelve-year-old daughter, begged for his life. Her words had no effect, so Pocahontas ran to Smith. She took his hand in her arms and laid her own head against his head. Smith was released and went back to Jamestown. Soon after Smith returned, one hundred new settlers from England arrived. It was a very cold winter, and in January, Jamestown was accidentally set on fire. The settlers suffered from cold and hunger the rest of the winter. Every four or five days, Pocahontas and her attendants came. They brought food for the hungry settlers. Even so, half of them died. In the summer, John Smith explored that part of the coast of America. He made a map that would be very valuable for future sailors and settlers. On his return, Smith was elected leader of the colony at Jamestown. However, some settlers did not like having to follow rules. Some encouraged the Indians to try to kill Smith. Chief Powhatan agreed. He also refused to supply food to the colony, hoping to starve them out. Pocahontas warned Smith about the plot against his life. Smith had to fight off several attempts to kill him. Finally, the colony seemed to be growing, and the Indians became peaceful. But in late 1609, Smith was injured in an explosion and returned to England. Pocahontas remained a friend to the colony. She married John Rolfe, one of the settlers. In 1616, she traveled to England with her husband and son. There she saw John Smith once again. She was so surprised to see him that she was unable to speak for several days. Pocahontas had believed that Smith was dead. The following year, she died and was buried in England. Pocahontas's love for Smith and Smith's determination to fight for the colony had saved Jamestown and given the English their first colony in America. Gribio. Saint Francis of Assisi, who lived in Italy in the early 13th century, was known for his love of animals. He was the first person who celebrated the birth of Jesus by gathering live animals around a manger. He often talked to the birds as he traveled along. Sometimes the birds would fly down and sit on his head, shoulders, knees, and arms. But the best-known animal story concerns Saint Francis and the Wolf of Gribio. Saint Francis was known for his humility and his unwillingness to hurt anyone. Once, when one of his followers spoke harshly to some bandits, Saint Francis told the man to run after the bandits and apologize. In the same way, Saint Francis thought of animals as his brothers and sisters. Once, when he was warned about some dangerous wolves, he replied that he had never harmed Brother Wolf and didn't expect the wolf to harm him. While Saint Francis was staying in the hill town of Gribio, he heard about a large, fierce wolf. The townspeople were terrified of this wolf and had eaten both domestic animals and humans. Saint Francis decided to help the people and went out to talk to the wolf. The people watched in horror as the wolf came running to attack Saint Francis, but the saint made the sign of the cross. Then he said to the wolf that, in the name of Jesus. It should stop hurting people. The wolf then lay down at Saint Francis's feet. Saint Francis addressed a little sermon to the wolf. He recounted all the terrible things that the wolf had done, but he added that he wanted to make peace between the wolf and the townspeople. The wolf nodded its head in approval. In return for the wolf's agreement to keep the peace, Saint Francis promised him that he would arrange for the townspeople to feed him. When he asked the wolf never again to harm any person or animal, the wolf nodded again. Then the wolf put out its paw as a sign that it would keep its promise. The wolf walked beside Saint Francis back into Gribio. When a crowd assembled, the saint preached to them about how God had allowed the wolf to terrify them because of their sins. He told them to repent, and God would forgive them. Then he spoke of the promise that the wolf had made, and what he had promised the wolf in return. The people agreed to feed the wolf regularly, 
and the wolf again indicated that it would not hurt anyone. Again, it put its paw in St. Francis's hand. The wolf and the people kept the agreement. Two years later, the wolf died. The people remembered how it no longer hurt anyone, and that not a single dog ever barked at it. The townspeople of Gribio lamented its death. Whenever it went through town, it had reminded them of the virtues and holiness of St. Francis. Texas The state of Texas is famous for having the biggest and best of everything. Before Alaska became a state, Texas was the largest American state. It was also famous for its huge cattle ranches. Cotton is a major crop, but much of the wealth comes from oil and gas. People think of Texans as being wealthy because there have been lots of cattle and oil millionaires. In the late 19th century, Texas cattlemen used to drive their herds north to Kansas. There, a train to the east shipped the cows. Eventually, the railroad came to Texas, and the great cattle drive stopped. By then, many Texans owned large ranches and were quite wealthy. In the 20th century, oil has made many Texans wealthy. Oil refining has led to chemical industries and synthetic products. Most Texans now live in cities. Many oil companies have their headquarters in Dallas. Other large manufacturing cities are Houston, Corpus Christi, Fort Worth, and Austin, which is the capital of Texas. Several cities, such as San Antonio and El Paso, have a strong Spanish influence. This dates back to the first Spanish visitors in the 16th century. The old mission at San Antonio is famous as the Alamo, where an important battle for Texas independence was fought. Texas is a huge area with mountains, deserts, prairies, rivers, and islands. The rugged beauty of its grasslands and deserts attracts many tourists. For a state that is mostly dry, Texas has a remarkable variety of wildflowers in the spring. Its animals and birds differ from other parts of the USA. Texas has the armored insect eater, the armadillo, the swift running bird, the road runner, prairie dogs, jackrabbits, kangaroo rats, wild pigs, horned lizards, and 100 species of snakes. As might be expected also, it has many beautiful kinds of cacti and other desert plants. At its largest, Texas is more than 600 miles wide by 600 miles long. Such a large area develops a distinct culture of its own, and Texans are widely recognized by their accent and manner of speaking, their attitudes and interests, and their sense of independence and self-reliance. Texas is also known for its beautiful women, who regularly win national beauty contests. Its men have a reputation for being rugged, for not talking more than they have to, and for being straightforward and honest. Although many people think of cowboys and Indians when they think of Texas, it is a center for high-tech industries. The American Space Program has its headquarters in Houston, and Mission Control Center is there. Texas is also an important manufacturer of computers and other high-tech products. Oil production is still important in Texas, but it ranks third as a source of revenue behind manufacturing and tourism. The colorful history of Texas and its wonderful scenery contribute to a thriving tourist industry. Texas is also an important business and financial area. Yes, even though times have changed, Texans proudly maintain that their state still has the biggest and best of everything. The Grand Canyon The Grand Canyon is one of the most spectacular sights in nature. It is found in one section of the valley of the Colorado River. The river begins its course high in the Rocky Mountains of the state of Colorado. The river travels a total of 1,400 miles through Colorado, Utah, and Arizona and into the Gulf of California. It forms part of Arizona's border with Nevada and California. The Colorado River is a very swift and muddy river. It carries dirt and rocks down from the mountains. 
The story is told of an old fur trader who was attacked by Indians high up the river. His only escape was down the Colorado River in a small boat. It was a terrifying trip through rapids and around rocks at top speed. The fur trader was found some days later in very rough shape, hundreds of miles down the river. No one would believe that he had come so far so fast. The Grand Canyon stretches for about 250 miles in the state of Arizona. The canyon was carved out by the flow of the river itself. In places, the canyon is more than a mile deep. It stretches from four to 18 miles wide at the top. The canyon valley contains worn rocks that rise up like a mountain range. The canyon has been worn down through many layers of rock. The river has cut its way down through layers of sandstone, limestone, and shaped to the granite bedrock. The different layers are of different colors, and the rocks appear very beautiful, especially at sunrise and sunset. Because the canyon is so deep, the climate changes as you go down into the valley. At the top, the climate is typical of a mountain area with evergreen trees. Next, you have typical forest trees. Third, there are plants like cacti that grow in warm deserts. Finally, there are subtropical plants at the valley bottom. Tourists can ride down the narrow trails to the bottom of the valley on mules. On one side is the rock wall of the canyon, and on the other side is a steep drop down to the bottom. Tourists have to trust their guide and the mule that they are riding to get them down safely. The trails zigzag back and forth, and the tourist going down travels much more than a mile. Some 1,000 square miles of the area became the Grand Canyon National Park in 1919. Because the Colorado River is very swift and runs through dry country, several dams have been built along it. These are designed to harness its power, save its water, and provide recreational opportunities. The best-known dam is Hoover Dam, formerly Boulder Dam, on the Arizona-Nevada border. This impressive structure is 727 feet high and 1,282 feet long. Elevators are used to carry workers up and down inside the dam. The water, which is backed up by the Hoover Dam, forms Lake Mead. Lake Mead is used to irrigate nearby land as well as for boating and fishing. The dam itself is a major source of electric power for this section of the country. Visitors to the Grand Canyon are often filled with awe by the size and beauty of the canyon. People seem very small in comparison to the immense cliffs, valleys, and the mighty river. The Welland Canal. Before railways and automobiles became common, transporting goods over long distances was a difficult chore. In early North America, roads were often bad or non-existent. In the winter, snow and cold weather made travel difficult. Frontier farmers had trouble selling their crops because it was hard to get them to the cities. Often, rivers and lakes were the best ways to travel. Fur traders carried their furs and other supplies in canoes, but even large canoes were not big enough to hold a shipment of wheat. Rapids and waterfalls meant that goods had to be taken out of the canoe and carried to the next body of calm water. One way to improve water transportation was to build a canal. In New York State, Governor DeWitt Clinton had constructed the Erie Canal from the Niagara River to the Hudson River soon after the War of 1812. Because relations between the United States and Canada were still not very friendly, this was another reason to build a canal on the Canadian side. Canals could be used to move supplies and troops during wartime. Sometimes the British government would forbid Canadian farmers to sell food to the USA. Without a canal to move their farm produce, crops were sometimes left to rot. A Saint Catharines, Ontario merchant named William Hamilton Merritt thought about all these things in the 1820s. He also thought that flour mills needed a more reliable source of water to operate. Saint Catharines is on Twelve Mile Creek below the Niagara Escarpment. This creek runs towards Lake Ontario. It rises above the escarpment, which stands from 150 to 300 feet high, then runs towards Lake Ontario. 
If Merritt could join the 12 Mile Creek to one of the rivers, which ran to Lake Erie, the canal would provide transportation and water power. The problem was to find a way to move boats up the escarpment. From 1824 to 1829, Merritt and his friends hired laborers to dig away tons of dirt and rock. Nearly all the work was done with shovels, pickaxes, horses, and wagons. In places, the ground was soft and landslides occurred. In other places, the men had to dig through solid granite rock. Merritt's main problem, however, was raising the money to pay for the construction. After sinking all the money that he, his family, and friends had into the canal, more was needed. Merritt went to Toronto, New York, and finally London, England, to get the financial support he needed. The problem of getting the boats to climb the escarpment was solved by a series of 35 wooden locks. These carried a ship 327 feet upwards. The ship would enter a lock with a small amount of water. More water would come into the lock, lifting the boat another 10 or 15 feet. Then the ship would move into the next lock and be lifted up again. Boats going in the opposite direction were lowered instead of lifted. The Welland Canal has been rebuilt three times since the first canal opened in 1829. Now large seagoing and lake vessels cross the Niagara Peninsula from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. They carry grain, coal, iron ore, oil, and many other bulk products. The Welland Canal remains one of the most important commercial waterways in the world. Hernias repaired here. A hernia occurs when there is a tear or weakness in the muscle layers of the abdomen. This allows the intestines to push forward into the gap. Usually, the person feels some discomfort and may notice an egg-shaped swelling. In a few cases, the muscle layers may clamp down on the protruding intestine and cut off its oxygen supply. This can result in death if medical help is not readily available. Hernias are more common in men than women, and are often related to lifting heavy materials. Although most hernias are not a serious threat to health, they usually get worse over time. The only cure is surgery to repair the cut, tear, or weakness. As with any surgery, time in a hospital is usually required for recovery. This proved to be a problem in Canada during World War II. Many young men were declared unfit for military service because they had hernias. During the war, there was a shortage of doctors and beds for hernia repair. A Toronto doctor, Dr. Edward Schuldice, decided to address this problem. He personally operated on seventy of these young men using a technique of his own. This Schuldice technique allowed the patients a quicker recovery time than the usual method. It also had a much lower rate of complications and failures. After the war, Dr. Schuldice opened his own hernia clinic for the public. In 1953, a second hospital was started in Thornhill, just north of Toronto, and today all surgery is done there. The Schuldice Hospital is located on a beautiful piece of land with a valley on one side and a golf course on the other. The large grounds have wonderful gardens and flowering trees. There are nature paths for patients to walk on. The building itself is not a regular hospital, but more like a hotel or residence where patients can play the piano, shoot pool, play shuffleboard, or practice their putting. The hospital now has 89 beds, and an average of 30 hernia operations are performed daily. Since all the surgeons are specialists, their level of skill is very high, and less than one percent of operations need to be corrected. The worldwide rate of failure is around twenty percent. For patients, the good news is that everything at the hospital is directed to repairing their hernia and aiding their recovery as quickly as possible. The staff encourages its patients to walk and exercise within four or five hours of surgery. Patients usually stay on for several more days until they are fully recovered and ready to go home. Schuldice's best advertisements are his satisfied customers. 
hernia patients come not only from Canada and the United States, but also from many countries of the world to receive the best possible treatment. Shouldice remains the most famous hospital in the world, devoted entirely to the repair and treatment of hernias. The War That Both Sides Won Today, the 3,000-mile boundary between Canada and the United States is known as the longest undefended boundary in the world. But for three years in a row, 1812, 1813, and 1814, U.S. armies invaded Canada. When both sides failed to win a clear victory and the costs of the war kept growing, the two countries decided that peace was the best policy. On June 18, 1812, the United States declared war on Great Britain. The United States had proclaimed their independence from Britain in 1776, 36 years earlier. There were still bad feelings between the two countries. Great Britain was not treating the United States as an equal independent country. British ships were stopping American ships from trading with Europe. British sailors went aboard American ships looking for deserters from the British Navy. If an American sailor could not prove that he was an American, he was taken to work for the British. At the same time, the population of the United States was expanding. Americans wanted to move west into lands held by various American Indian tribes. Some Americans felt that Britain was encouraging the Indians to fight them and was supplying guns to the Indians. In 1812, Canada was made up of a small number of British colonies just north of the American border. Americans felt it would be easy to take over Canada, then Canadian land would provide homes for their growing population. Since Americans outnumbered Canadians 10 to 1, the U.S. government thought that no one in Canada would dare oppose them. Moreover, Britain was fighting a terrible war in Europe against Napoleon, the Emperor of France, and could not spare any troops to help defend Canada. But in 1812, Canada had one advantage over the USA, good leadership. British General Isaac Brock had served in Canada for 10 years. He knew how to inspire both his own soldiers and the ordinary people of Canada to fight for their country. He was a bold and energetic leader who moved quickly to attack American positions before they could attack him. Brock found a valuable ally in the American Indian chief Tecumseh. Tecumseh had been trying to unite the scattered groups of Indians to fight together against American expansion. He convinced the Indians that their best chance for success was to join the British and Canadians against the Americans. Although both Brock and Tecumseh were killed in battles, their example continued to inspire the defenders of Canada to fight against the American invasions. Before the end of 1814, all American forces had been driven out of Canada. By 1814, Britain had defeated the French Emperor Napoleon, now it was the turn of the United States to be invaded. A large British force attacked the heart of the United States and burned the government buildings at Washington. Another British force attacked the USA near the mouth of the Mississippi River, but it was defeated at the Battle of New Orleans. Both sides were tired of fighting by this time, and a peace treaty was signed on December 24, 1814. This agreement restored everything to the way it had been when the war began. Although this really meant that no one had won the war, both sides claimed victory. The Americans felt that they had gained full recognition of their independence. Britain would no longer board their ships or encourage the Indians to fight them. Canadians felt that they had shown Americans that they wanted to develop their own country in their own way, separate from the United States. But the biggest result of the war was the decision by both countries never to fight each other again. Death Valley, California The steep mountains of southeastern California dip suddenly into a deep valley. Rain is kept out of the valley by the high mountains which form its western slopes. Although mountains surround the valley, Death Valley itself is very low. 
In fact, its lowest point is 282 feet below sea level, the lowest point of land in North or South America. Death Valley is about 140 miles long, but only a few miles wide. It got its name in 1849 during the California Gold Rush. Gold seekers attempted to cross Death Valley on the way to California's gold fields, and some died of thirst there. There's hardly any water in the valley. The average rainfall is only a couple of inches a year. It is also one of the hottest places in North America in the summer. Temperatures of 134 Fahrenheit have been recorded. As a result of this heat and dryness, Death Valley is a desert. These conditions give rise to the valley's most important products: mineral salts and salt deposits. One of these products is borax, which has many industrial uses. Borax was removed from the desert using 20 mule teams hitched in a long string. Later, a railway was built to help carry out these minerals. In spite of its desert conditions, Death Valley has considerable animal and plant life. Of course, its animals and plants are those typical in desert conditions. Only on the salt flats do plants refuse to grow. With even a small rainfall in the spring, the desert will come alive with wild flowers. Very few places in the world have such a contrast in heights and depths. The mountains near the valley are among the highest in continental USA, while the valley itself is the lowest elevation. Mount Whitney, at 14,495 feet, is less than 100 miles from Death Valley. The climate in the valley from October to May is generally pleasant. Since Death Valley is now a national park, many tourists visit during this season. Now roads and hotels provide comfortable access. Death Valley is located close to the Nevada border. Its desert conditions are common throughout the area of the American West. Just east of the coastal mountains, in most cases, heavy rain falls along the coast, but very little in the interior. Because there is no farming and water is hard to obtain, Death Valley and similar desert areas have very few permanent residents. Ebenezer Scrooge, in the story A Christmas Carol, Scrooge is an English businessman who thinks about nothing but money. He has no friends and spends no time with his family. He lives alone, eats alone, and works alone, except for his underpaid clerk Bob Cratchit. Scrooge never spends his money, but hoards it all and prides himself on his frugality. Scrooge hates Christmas; it's all nonsense to him. People spend money on food and gifts and parties; often they can't afford what they spend. Worse than that, they take a whole day off work and so lose a chance to make more money. Scrooge is angry that he has to give his clerk the day off with pay. He feels that he's being robbed. Christmas is also a time when people are asked to give money to help the poor. Scrooge is angry when two men come to his door asking for donations. Scrooge argues that he pays taxes, which support prisons and workhouses. It is not his business to worry about the problems of other people. Scrooge represents businessmen who see the bottom line as all that matters. Scrooge's partner Marley had died seven years earlier. He was like Scrooge in all respects. That evening, which is Christmas Eve, Scrooge is visited by Marley's ghost. Marley drags steel chains round about him, which contain keys, cash boxes, ledgers, purses, and deeds. These are the things that Marley cared about when he was alive. Marley is condemned in death to wander the world, and tells Scrooge that the same fate is likely to happen to him. However, three spirits will visit Scrooge, and if Scrooge listens to them, he may escape this fate. The first spirit comes and takes Scrooge back to the early scenes of his own life. He sees himself being left behind at school while the other boys went home for the holidays. Then his little sister arrives to tell him he could go home too. Another scene was of a cheerful Christmas party when Scrooge was a young man. A third scene showed him with the girl he was planning to marry. She left him because he no longer cared about anything but money. The second spirit shows Scrooge what people are doing that very Christmas. He shows Scrooge the preparations that people, even poor people, are making to celebrate Christmas. They visit Bob Cratchit's tiny home. There, they see the family cooking their little Christmas dinner. 
Bob's son, Tiny Tim, has been weakened by disease and has to use a crutch to walk. The family is delighted with its meal, small as it is. They see other scenes of poor people, miners and sailors, celebrating Christmas. Finally, they visit Scrooge's nephew and view his Christmas party and its games. The third spirit was the spirit of Christmas yet to come, the future. This spirit does not talk, but points to scenes connected with Scrooge. They overhear some businessmen joking about someone who has recently died. Scrooge sees that he no longer occupies his usual place of business. The spirit then shows him two women who have stolen the bedclothes, curtains, and clothes off the dead man and taken them to a pawnbroker. The spirit takes Scrooge to the room where the dead man died. The only people who are happy about the death are a young couple who owed him money. The spirit then shows Scrooge the Cratchit's house where they're mourning the death of Tiny Tim. Finally, the spirit takes him to a churchyard where they stand among the graves. Then the spirit points to the name of the dead man on the tombstone, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge is going to die, and no one will care. Scrooge finds himself in his own bed on Christmas morning. He is resolved now to avoid the fate that the spirits had shown him. He is delighted that he is getting a second chance. Scrooge decides to surprise all his acquaintances, and he begins by buying a huge goose and sending it to the Cratchits. On his walk, he meets the two men collecting for the poor and offers them a large sum of money. He goes on to join his nephew at a Christmas party. The next day, when Bob Cratchit comes into work, Scrooge gives him a raise in his salary. He also takes care of Tiny Tim so that Tim recovers his health. Charles Dickens' story was written at a time when governments did very little to help the poor. Wages were very low, and many businessmen were unwilling to look after their workers properly. Dickens points out that people like Scrooge not only make other people unhappy, but also are usually unhappy themselves. It is possible to be a very rich businessman and a poor human being at the same time. Etiquette. Etiquette is a French word. The original meaning was little tickets. These tickets were given to people who were attending a public ceremony. Printed on the ticket were instructions about how to behave on this occasion. So etiquette came to mean the way to behave on public occasions. Etiquette today includes how to introduce people, how to eat properly, how to dress for different occasions, how to speak to different people, and what to do on special occasions. Almost every part of social life can have its particular etiquette. Sometimes etiquette changes or seems to change. There was much behavior attached to courtship, such as a man holding the door open for a woman. Nowadays, some people find this outdated. But politeness is always a good idea. It is nice to hold the door open for the next person, whoever they are. In fact, it sometimes seems like contemporary life encourages bad manners. Etiquette is no longer taught to young people. Moreover, in a youth culture, young people take their examples from other young people. As a result, good manners aren't considered important. The point of etiquette is to help people to get along with each other. If people behave in an accepted manner, there is less chance of misunderstanding. It is important for people to think about treating other people well. If everyone does what they feel like doing, it doesn't seem like they respect other people. Etiquette can help things to go a lot smoother. Manners vary from culture to culture, but the intention is the same: to treat people with consideration. This is a way to reduce conflict. Sometimes we can understand where these customs come from. Originally, shaking hands with your right hand probably meant that you weren't carrying a weapon. Taking off your hat may originally have been taking off your helmet. This meant that you weren't going to fight. Nowadays, there are new areas of social life. For example, a lot of conversation now takes place on the telephone. Perhaps because there is no traditional telephone etiquette, some people feel free to be rude. Try to treat the person on the phone just the way you would treat them if you were actually talking to them. Most people feel it is rude to interrupt a conversation, but many people seem to think that it is okay to interrupt someone talking on the phone. Children especially need to be taught not to interrupt. 
The internet also needs its own etiquette or netiquette, because you cannot see whom you are talking to, and they may be thousands of miles away. It is easy to misunderstand. Also, people cannot hear the tone of your voice over the internet. For this reason, some people use smileys, little faces, to show how they are feeling. If they make a joke, they can use a smiling face or print grin after their remark. This tips off the recipient that their remark is not to be taken seriously. Using simple words like please and thank you can make everyday life a lot smoother and happier. Like a lot of other things, we do not realize the importance of etiquette until it starts to disappear. John Chapman, American Pioneer. When the first Europeans came to North America, they found dense forests coming down right to the shore. So thick were the forests that it was said that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River without once touching the ground. Clearing these trees to make room for fields and buildings was a very difficult task for the early settlers. Another difficulty was finding enough food in this new land. Many European crops could not grow in this climate. Carrying and storing seeds over a long period was also risky. Native Indians were often helpful in teaching the settlers how to find food, but sometimes there were no Indians nearby, or they were hostile. John Chapman is famous today because he helped the early settlers grow one important product: apples. Apples could be eaten fresh in the fall or stored through the winter. They could be made into fresh apple juice or alcoholic cider. They could be dried or made into apple sauce. Apples also could be made into vinegar, which is very useful for keeping vegetables from spoiling. John Chapman was born in Massachusetts in 1774, the year before the American Revolution began. John's father joined George Washington's army to fight for American independence from Great Britain. While the war was going on, John's mother died. In 1870, John's father married again, and soon John had lots of younger brothers and sisters. John probably worked on his father's farm as he was growing up. Then he worked on neighboring farms. It may be at this time that John began to learn about apples. After the Revolutionary War, the population of the USA was expanding. Many Americans wanted to go west over the mountains to find land in Indian territory. In the fall of 1797, young John Chapman headed west to Pennsylvania. On his way, he gathered leftover apple seeds from the cider mills that he passed. As usual, John walked barefoot, but as he traveled, snow began to fall. He tore strips off his coat and tied them around his feet. Then he made snowshoes out of tree branches. When he arrived in the West, he began to clear land and plant apple seeds. This began a pattern that would last Chapman's whole life. He would travel ahead of the settlers, clear land, and then sell his baby apple trees to the settlers when they arrived. When the area became too settled, Chapman would move further west and start again. Many settlers regarded John Chapman as a strange character. He never bought new clothes, but wore whatever old clothes came his way. But he was always welcome at a settler's cabin. John was good at clearing land, telling stories, and growing apples. He liked children, and children liked him. He was a religious man and would read to the settlers about God and living together peacefully. At this time, there was conflict between the settlers and Indians about land. John managed to be friendly with both groups, but John did warn the settlers if the Indians were planning to attack them. Every fall, John went east to gather more apple seeds. He would then go farther west and find some empty land to plant his seeds. During the warm weather, he tended all his fields of baby apple trees. Once they were properly grown, he sold the seedlings to settlers. When he had earned enough money, he bought land to grow more apple trees. In his own lifetime, he became known as Johnny Appleseed. Legends grew up about him. It was said that his bare feet could melt snow and that he could leap across rivers. Johnny Appleseed never built himself a real home.
He was a wanderer all his life, traveling west to Indiana and Iowa and back east again. He enjoyed sleeping outdoors, lying on his back, looking up at the stars, and thinking about God and His world. He died in Indiana in 1845, and no one knows exactly where he's buried. But all through that region are hundreds of apple trees. These apple trees are the most fitting memorial to John Chapman, the legendary Johnny Appleseed. Little House on the Prairie. Much of the history of North America is about how Europeans moved westward from the Atlantic coast towards the Pacific. The first settlements began around 1600, and it was a long time before the Europeans settled the interior. By the late 18th century, however, good farmland along the east coast was becoming scarce. As the population increased, people began thinking about all the native Indian lands. Further inland, families were quite large in pioneer days, and the oldest son usually inherited the family farm. This meant that other sons and daughters would have to move away when their parents died. Often, the sons would want to begin their own farm and start their own family. But if there was no farmland available, or if it was too expensive to buy, they were out of luck. One option was to move west, where land was free or very cheap. Sometimes the whole family might move if their old farm was no longer productive. Sometimes the old farm was on poor soil, or too much farming had exhausted the soil. Perhaps better land could be had further west. There were other reasons for moving west. Pioneer settlers depended on wild birds, fish, and wild animals for food, furs, and skins for clothing and trading, and trees for building materials. These things had become scarce in old settled areas. Out west, there were lots of animals to hunt for food, and animal skins could be traded for supplies. It seemed that it was easier to make a living on the frontier. Of course, there were some problems regarding moving west. Various American Indian tribes who might fight to defend their land occupied the land. Then the land needed to be cleared of trees and stumps before it could be planted. A log cabin and other buildings had to be built. A well had to be dug, or a spring of water found. Settlers might also suffer because there were no doctors or teachers or stores available. These things, though, often did follow closely behind the first settlers. A series of little house books, written by Laura Ingalls Wilder, tells the story of her pioneer family. The Ingalls family moved many times while Laura was a little girl. She was born in Wisconsin in 1867. Her family moved next year to Missouri. Then they moved to Kansas in 1869. The Ingalls moved back to Wisconsin in 1871. They moved to Minnesota in 1874. Her family went to Iowa in 1876, then back to Minnesota in 1877. Finally, they moved to Dismit, South Dakota, in 1879, and there the family remained. All these moves were typical for a pioneer family, always on the lookout for better land and other opportunities. But all these moves involved very hard work. All of which seemed all lost when the family had to move again. For example, when Laura's parents moved to the Kansas Prairie in 1869, they had many hardships. The family put all their belongings in a covered wagon, which measured four feet by ten feet. Two horses pulled it, and the family dog followed along. Laura and her sister Mary were very little girls. The family and their wagon were nearly washed away trying to cross a small river. 
They traveled through wild, tall grass where there were no roads. Laura's father built a house on the open prairie with logs he had hauled from the creek bottoms. One of the nearby settlers helped him. They also built a log stable for the horses. That was a good thing because the next night their little house was surrounded by a pack of fifty large wolves. They formed a large circle around the house and howled all night. One day, while Laura's father was away, two Indians visited the house. They wanted Laura's mother to feed them. And stood silent while the food was cooking. The Indians wore only fresh skunk skins as clothing. After the Indians had eaten all the food, they left. The following spring, there was a large gathering of Indian tribes. Most of them wanted to fight the settlers. For many nights, the sounds of Indian drums frightened the settlers. One tribe opposed the plan, and finally, the gathering broke up. And the Indians went away. Many other problems faced the Ingalls family. These included bad weather, prairie grass fires, and malaria. The worst part was having to leave their new homes. The government decided that Laura's family was living on Indian land and would have to move. So the covered wagon was packed again, and the family traveled north. Such experiences were not unusual for pioneers in the 19th century. Handel's Messiah. George Frederick Handel was a native of Germany and spoke with a German accent all his life. Most of that life, however, was spent in London, England. As a young musician, Handel's sponsor was the Elector of Hanover. Later on, when the Elector became King George the First of England, he continued to sponsor Handel. The young Handel went to Italy to study opera. Opera had become a very fashionable entertainment for the upper classes. Handel traveled to England in 1711 and made an immediate success with his operas. Queen Anne granted him a royal pension for life in 1713. Because of this initial success, Handel tried to start a permanent opera company in London, but this failed and Handel lost money. Since operas used full stage settings with costumes, scenery, and props, they were expensive to produce. Handel decided to produce oratorios in which the parts were simply sung without actions. On August twenty-second, seventeen forty-one, Handel began to work on his oratorio, The Messiah. The text was made up of passages from the Bible relating to the birth, life, and death of Jesus. Handel worked on it feverishly, missing meals and going without sleep. He finished it twenty-four days later. When he was asked how he felt on completing it, Handel said, "I thought I saw all heaven before me and the great God Himself." In the fall of 1741, Handel received an invitation from the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland to present operas and concerts there. Handel traveled from London to Dublin with his entire luggage and many of his singers. However, in order to rehearse on the way, he had to hire local people to fill in. Once the composer soundly criticized one local singer who failed to meet his standards. Handel was warmly received in Dublin, where his concerts were sold out. Even his rehearsals were considered newsworthy by the local papers. The Messiah was first publicly performed on April thirteenth, seventeen forty-two. Seven hundred people squeezed into a six hundred seat theater to hear it. A notice had requested that ladies attend in hoopless skirts and that gentlemen come without their swords. A Dublin paper reported: "Words are wanting to express the exquisite delight it afforded to the admiring crowded audience." All proceeds were donated to charity, as the church choirs had refused to participate except on those conditions. Handel returned to London in August 1742 and prepared the oratorio for the London stage. The Messiah made its London debut on March 23, 1743, with King George II in the audience. It was during the Hallelujah chorus that the king jumped to his feet and so initiated a tradition that has lasted ever since.
With such oratories, Handel was able to re-establish his popularity and restore his finances in London. The Messiah continued to be performed. After conducting it on April 6, 1759, the old composer collapsed and had to be carried home. He died eight days later. The Messiah remains Handel's most popular work, combining wonderful music with inspiring religious sentiments. The biblical text speaks of hope and salvation, and the music allows the text to soar into angelic songs. Peggy's Cove, Nova Scotia. Why do people travel hundreds of miles to look at beautiful scenery? And why does one particular place attract many more visitors than similar places not far away? Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia, Canada is one of those special spots that draws people from all over the world. It is hard to explain its special charm, but anyone who has been there will know what I am talking about. The southern eastern shore of Nova Scotia possesses many picturesque fishing villages and many beautiful seascapes, but one doesn't have to go very far from the capital city of Halifax to see this special spot. There are no trees around Peggy's Cove. The dominant feature are huge, round granite rocks, many of them the size of houses. They seem to be pushing up and out of the land and sea. Nestled inside the circle of these rocks is a group of fishing huts. Now and then a fishing boat leaves by the little bay or cove in order to travel out into the great Atlantic Ocean. For nearly 200 years, there have been fishermen at Peggy's Cove. All around the little harbor, there are huts or fish stores where the fishermen do their work. Here they bring in the fish and clean them, wash them and salt them. The salted fish are then stored in barrels. Nowadays, however, more fish are sold fresh than salted. Visiting as a tourist, I wandered into one of these little huts while the fisherman was busy at his work. He explained to me that although Peggy's Cove is a tourist destination, it is also a working fishing village. The fishermen get no money from the tourists, but have to take the time to talk to them and explain their work. There are, however, some tourist shops and tea rooms in the vicinity. Part of the charm of Peggy's Cove is that it is so small. The population has been well under 100 people for most of its history. The buildings are mostly small dwellings, with the lighthouse being the most prominent structure. A good variety of fish are caught in the area, including mackerel, herring, haddock, cod and halibut. Lobsters are also trapped nearby. However, because of overfishing, catches have declined in recent decades. The plants and animals of the area are also of interest. Showy purple lupins grow close to the ocean. They thrive on salty ground, and the closer they grow to the spray of the ocean, the better. One of the world's few carnivorous plants, the common pitcher plant, also grows around Peggy's Cove. Its leaves trap insects, which are digested to nourish the plant. Common birds are the stately blue heron, which likes to fish in the marshy pools. The heron stands several feet high and spear fish and frogs with its sharp beak. Another bird is the osprey, or fish hawk. The osprey's keen eyes can spot a fish moving beneath the surface of the water. It can dive swiftly, hitting the water with great speed, catch the fish in its claws, and then fly away with its catch. I have also seen pools close to the ocean full of large tadpoles. These tadpoles spend several years in the water before they develop into bullfrogs. Bullfrogs, the largest Canadian frog, have been known to eat baby ducks and small fish. Looking over the little harbor and out toward the great ocean, one notices the contrast between the very small and the very large If Peggy's Cove were larger, it would be more ordinary. As it is, it represents all the little fishing villages where men have gone forth in little boats to fish on the wide ocean. Sunday Morning at Church Every Sunday is a holiday or half-holiday in North America. Some stores may be open, but banks, offices, and government services are usually closed. Sunday closing has a Christian origin. 
Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday morning, so Sunday is known as the Lord's Day. About 30 or 35 percent of North Americans attend church regularly on Sunday mornings. About the same percentage attend church occasionally. At Christmas and Easter, the churches are very full as people celebrate these two important holy days. Nearly everybody goes to church at least three times. They are baptized or dedicated as a child. Most people are married in a church, and many people are buried after a church service. Church services are usually held Sunday mornings, often at 11 o'clock a.m., although there may also be evening services provided. Most services last an hour. Their purpose is to worship God and to help people focus on religious and moral beliefs. The service is led by a pastor, minister, or priest, who usually also looks after the people and the business of the church. It is the pastor who delivers the sermon, a 20-minute talk on a religious or moral matter. Usually, members take part in the service. They may lead the singing, read from the Bible, offer prayers for the congregation, take up the collection, or act as ushers. Most churches also have a choir, a group of singers who lead in singing the hymns. There are many cultural traditions connected to going to church. People normally wear their best clothing and try to be on their best behavior. Talking or making noise in church is usually considered bad. This is why children often have a separate children's church or Sunday school, where they can be more like children. The Sunday service is the main weekly event at many churches. But nowadays, there are a growing number of large super churches which organize all kinds of activities for their members. These churches usually have large buildings and a large staff to plan and lead various activities. These might include prayer group, counseling and social work, youth programs, social action, fundraising events, etc. Many large churches have gymnasiums for regular sports activities. At the same time, house churches are also becoming very popular. These are small groups of people who meet at private homes. Sometimes a group will meet in a house until they have the money to buy a church. But many people say they prefer to meet in small groups. That way they get to know one another better. Then they feel comfortable sharing their problems and successes and praying for each other. Some say that large churches can interfere with getting close to God and other Christians. There are many different brands of Christianity. The largest single denomination in North America is Roman Catholicism. One large Christian brands are Episcopalian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, and Presbyterian. All have slightly different traditions and beliefs. Although in the past these groups have often been in conflict with one another, today they usually cooperate in working together for their members and the community. The Calgary Stampede The Wild West as we know it from Hollywood Westerns did not last a long time. Its height was from about 1865 to 1885 for only 20 years. By 1885 there were railways across the plains, Fences had been built around farms and ranches, and lawmen were on the lookout for any troublemakers. Not only that, but by 1885, nearly all the buffalo had been killed, and most of the Indians were on reservations. Still, the Wild West had captured the imagination of the reading public. A former buffalo hunter and Indian scout, Buffalo Bill Cody, decided to take advantage of his fame as a cowboy. In 1883, he organized Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, and toured North America and Europe. Alberta, Canada had been the last part of the Old West to be settled, but by 1912, ranching was being replaced by farming. The city of Calgary was itself becoming a commercial and industrial center. Old-timers looked back fondly to the old days of cowboys and Indians. In 1908, the Miller Brothers' Wild West show visited Calgary. One of the cowboys, Guy Wiedek talked to local businessmen about putting on a rodeo and the Wild West show. Eventually, four Calgary businessmen put up $25,000 each to finance the event. Wiedek was a good organizer. He advertised all over the U.S. and the Canadian West for cowboys and rodeo riders to come. And with $25,000 in prize money, people came from as far away as Mexico. Wiedek was able to persuade the Canadian government to let large numbers of Indians leave their reservations to attend. In fact, the Indians were a big part of the program. 
The main rodeo events were bronco riding, bareback riding, women's bronco riding, steer roping, and bulldogging. These events were based on things that working cowboys actually did. But to make them harder, special bucking horses were brought in. One horse named Cyclone had never been ridden long by anyone. He had thrown 127 riders in a row. Most of the rodeo cowboys came from the United States, from Wyoming, Oregon, Oklahoma, Colorado, and Arizona. But there were also Canadian cowboys and some Canadian Indians competing. Queen Victoria's son, the Duke of Connaught, was the Grand Marshal. Many cowboys rode well, but no one could stay on Cyclone. On the sixth and final day, the grounds were muddy from rain, and the horses kept slipping. Cyclone escaped from his handlers and ran around the track. For his last bronco riding contest, Cyclone's rider would be Tom Three Persons. Three Persons was a blood Indian from southern Alberta. When Three Persons got on Cyclone, the horse would rear up and plunge its head down to throw the rider. Cyclone acted as though it would topple over backwards, but Three Persons hung on. Then it hurled itself forward with its head almost touching the ground. After a wild ride of several minutes, Cyclone began to tire. The judges declared Tom Three Persons the winner of the Bucking Bronco event. Three Persons was the only Canadian to win a major event at that first Calgary Stampede in 1912. Today, the Calgary Stampede continues to be the largest rodeo and Wild West show in North America. It has many new events and attractions and still attracts the best rodeo riders from all over North America. The Internet The first working computers in the 1950s and 1960s were large mainframe machines. In some ways, they were like large calculating machines. The U.S. government, the military, and businesses and institutions used them for specific tasks. For example, they might be used to handle the payroll. As more uses were found for computers, the need to transfer data from one computer to another became a concern. In 1969, the U.S. government sponsored a program to explore ways for computers to transfer data over telephone lines. The first Internet was created with four computers linked together. Of course, computer use increased beyond anyone's expectations. Standards were developed that describe how data was to be transferred between computers. A common language for commands and communications emerged. Operating programs such as MS-DOS, Unix, Macintosh, and Windows came into existence. The Internet quickly expanded beyond government and military uses. The PC became the standard form of computer. Private agencies acted as hosts for Internet usage. Around 1982, there were 213 hosts. By 1986, there were 2,300. Today, there are millions. The role of computers expanded so quickly that the USSR, which had discouraged computer use, found itself left behind by the USA. Part of the reason for the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 was that they had fallen too far behind the United States in high-tech areas to ever catch up. One of the most popular uses of the computer is electronic mail or email. You can send a letter by computer over the Internet to anywhere in the world in seconds or less, and it doesn't cost anything extra. Now data can be transferred great distances almost instantaneously. Another major Internet use is the World Wide Web. In the early days, all web pages were text only. In the 1990s, it became possible to make web pages interactive and multimedia. Interactive means that readers could click on items on the web page and get more information. They could also communicate directly with the web page owner. Multimedia means that web pages were no longer text only. They could also have graphics, film, video, and audio. This has helped to turn computers into popular entertainment. Nowadays, people spend hours every day surfing the net. However, there are some problems. For some people, computers are addictive. Many businesses are trying to control employees using the net during working hours. Since the Internet includes just about every kind of information, not all of it is good. You can find directions on how to become a criminal or a terrorist. There are scam artists who want to cheat you out of money. There are also aggressive 
pornography salesmen, not to mention people who want to kill your computer with viruses. Since the internet is not closely regulated, it's up to individual users to follow computer etiquette. Parents need to supervise their children's use of the net. Although the internet has some disadvantages, many people see the net as one of the greatest invention of modern times. The story of Anne Frank. War, persecution, and economic depression affect not only adults but also old people, children, babies, the sick, and the handicapped. Since history is written mostly about politicians, soldiers, intellectuals, and criminals, we don't read very often about how events affect ordinary people. Now and then, a special book will shed light on what it was like to live in the midst of terrible events. Such a book. Is the diary of Anne Frank. Anne Frank was born in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, in 1929. Her father Otto Frank was a businessman who moved the family to the Netherlands in 1934. In Amsterdam, Otto started a company selling pectin to make jams and jellies. Later, he began a second company that sold herbs for seasoning meat. Otto Frank had decided to leave Germany because of the policies and personality of the new German Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Hitler had a personal hatred not only for Jewish people but also for everything Jewish. He felt that one way to strengthen Germany and solve its problems was to kill or drive out all the Jews. Hitler also felt that other groups, such as blacks, gypsies, the handicapped, homosexuals, and a chronically unemployed, should be eliminated. Then only strong, healthy, true Jews. Germans would be left. Since Hitler had a plan to solve Germany's economic problems, he received a lot of popular support. Very few Germans realized that he was mentally and emotionally unbalanced and would kill anyone who got in his way. The Frank family was Jewish, and they felt that they would be safe in the Netherlands. However, in May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands and soon took over the government. In 1941, laws were passed to keep Jews separate from other Dutch citizens. The following year, Dutch Jews began to be shipped to concentration camps in Germany and Poland. Just before this began, Anne Frank, Otto's younger daughter, received a diary for her 13th birthday. Less than a month later, the whole family went into hiding. Otto Frank had made friends with the Dutch people who worked with him in his business operations. Now these friends were ready to help him, even though hiding Jews from the authorities was treated as a serious crime. Behind Otto Frank's business offices, there was another house that was not visible from the street. Here, the Franks moved many of their things. Only a few trusted people knew they were living there. The Franks moved into these small rooms on July six, nineteen forty-two, and they lived there with another Jewish family, the Van Pels, until the police captured them on August fourth, nineteen forty-four. So, for more than two years, the two families never went outside. All their food and supplies had to be brought to them. During this period, Anne Frank told her diary all of her thoughts and fears. Like any teenage girl, she hoped that good things would happen to her, that she would become a writer or a movie star. She complained that her parents treated her like a child. She insisted that she was grown up. She also talked about how difficult it was to live in a small area with seven other people and not to be able to go outside. She wrote about the war and hoped the Netherlands would soon be liberated from the Germans. Anne sometimes envied her older sister Margot, who was so much more mature and who never got into trouble. She and Margot wrote letters to each other to pass the time, and even had a romance with Peter Van Pels, who was seventeen. Then all their fears came true. All the eight Jews hiding in the house were arrested and eventually sent to Auschwitz death camp in Poland. Although the war was ending, it did not end soon enough for the Frank family. Only Otto Frank survived the war. One of their helpers, Miep Gies, saved Anne's diary and kept it. After the war, Otto Frank decided to publish it. Since 1947, more than 20 million copies had been sold in 55 languages. Anne's diary shows the terrible cost of hatred, persecution, and war better than any history book. Christmas holidays. In many ways, Christmas is the most important holiday in North America. It is the most important commercial festival. Most retail stores do half their annual business in the six weeks or so before Christmas. 
Christmas is an important holiday from work and school. Many workers take the whole week off between Christmas and New Year's Day. It is the biggest time of the year for parties, gift giving, home decorations, and visiting. Many homeowners compete to see who can have the best display of lights. It is also an important time for the entertainment industry. Many Christmas movies, TV shows, recordings, concerts, and plays are produced every year for the Christmas season. It is also the time of year when the largest number of people attend church, because Christmas is a religious festival too. It celebrates the birth of Jesus. How all these different things came together to become Christmas is a long story. Why, for example, is Jesus' birthday celebrated on December twenty-fifth? No one knows the exact day that Jesus was born, but Jesus was born during the Roman Empire, and for the Romans, December twenty-fifth was a very important day. The Romans had many gods and many religions. Two religions, both of which had one main god, were the worship of the invincible sun and Mithras. These gods were both honored on December twenty-fifth, because December twenty-fifth was just after the shortest day of the year. It was a natural time to worship the sun. December was also a time to celebrate the end of the agriculture year. The Romans held one of their main festivals, the Saturnalia, beginning on December seventeenth. That lasted for a week. The Romans also began the custom of celebrating New Year's Day on January first. So the last half of December and the beginning of January was a wonderful time for partying and games. The early Christians didn't know what day Jesus was born. At first, they celebrated his birthday on January sixth. However, as most people in the Roman Empire were becoming Christians, it was decided to move the date to December twenty-fifth. The celebration lasted twelve days until January sixth, and took the place of all other festivals. That way, people who were used to celebrating on December twenty-fifth would feel more comfortable. As different peoples became Christian, they brought their own customs to be part of Christmas. The people of Northern Europe used evergreen trees and mistletoe as symbols of spring and eternal life. The evergreen tree became the Christmas tree. The mistletoe is hung from the ceiling at Christmas for couples to kiss under. It was also in Northern Europe where the idea of Santa Claus or Father Christmas began. In Roman times, there was a man who became known as Saint Nicholas. He is said to have given gifts to the poor and provided dowries for poor girls who wouldn't otherwise be able to marry. The idea of the gift-giving saint became joined with the northern idea of spirit of Christmas festivities. It was a poem written in 1831 by the American writer Clement Moore, which popularized Santa Claus throughout the world. Twas the night before Christmas. Told the story of how Santa visits every house in the world on Christmas Eve and brings toys for good girls and boys. Since that time, parents have secretly bought toys for their children at Christmas. When the children awake on Christmas Day, they find toys by the chimney or under the Christmas tree. They are told that Santa Claus and his reindeer brought them. Adults also give gifts to each other at Christmas time. No wonder that the stores sell so many things. Then, it is often said that Christmas is becoming too commercialized. In the rush to get everything ready, to buy the gifts, decorate the house and tree, give parties, visit family and friends, and attend special Christmas events, the original reason for celebrating is sometimes forgotten. Only when people go to church or sing Christmas carols or attend musical performances about Jesus' birth, do they remember that Christmas is the birthday of Christ. Garage sales and yard sales. Every Saturday morning in our part of the world, except in winter, many people drive around the city looking for yard sales. Yard sales or garage sales often take place in the driveway of someone's home. Or perhaps the front lawn. The homeowners take out all the stuff they don't want and arrange it in front of their house. Usually, they put a price tag on items. People driving by will stop to see if there's anything they want. Many people spend every Saturday morning shopping at yard sales. If they find that they have bought too many things, then they have a yard sale of their own. Some of the shoppers are dealers who buy things for resale. 
Sometimes they resell them at their own yard sales, but some dealers are professionals who run antique stores, used bookshops, flea markets, or used furniture and appliance stores. Usually, the dealers will try to get to the yard sale before anyone else. That way, they have the best selection. Often, they'll try to buy items for less than what the price tag says. The cheaper they can buy the item, the more profit they can make when they resell it. Their motto is "Buy low, sell high." Sometimes a merchant will boast that he paid one dollar for a glass or china cup at a yard sale and sold it for a hundred dollars at his store or on the internet. By having catalogs that show the value of collectibles, dealers can sometimes make large profits. Now, however, many of the people having yard sales will try to check the value of the things they are selling first, so it is getting harder to get a real bargain. One reason for yard sales is that North Americans often live in big houses, which fill up with things. People may use the basement, the attic, the spare room, and the garage to store things that they aren't using. If they store things in their garage, all they have to do is open the garage door and have a garage sale. When children grow up and move away, the parents will often sell the children's old clothes, toys, and furniture. Another reason for yard sales is that there are a lot of things that people might like but don't want to pay full price for. For example, if someone likes to read novels, they may be happy to pay one dollar for a book at a yard sale rather than twenty or thirty dollars at a retail store. What sorts of things are sold at yard sales? Just about anything you might find in a house or yard. There are ornaments, china, home decorations, sports equipment, bicycles, games, dolls, toys, tables, and chairs, lamps, appliances, books, records, paintings, clothes, record players, and much, much more. Some items are things that were popular a few years ago, but now have gone out of fashion. This might include many toys, books, and games that relate to an old television show that is no longer being shown. While a lot of older people go to yard sales, so do a lot of students. Students and young people may need cheap furniture for their apartment or a bicycle to get to school or work. They may not be able to pay full price. If you are lucky, you can find almost anything at a yard sale. The trick is to get there early. Most yard sales are advertised to start at 9 a.m., but dealers may arrive as early as 7:30 a.m. By 10 a.m., the busiest part is already over. Although most yard sales go on into the afternoon, yard sales tend to prove the common saying that one person's trash is another person's treasure. Helen Keller. What would it be like to be unable to see anything, hear anything, or say anything? Life for young Helen Keller was like that. She had an illness before she was two years old that had left her deaf, dumb, and blind. After that, it was difficult for her to communicate with anyone. She could only learn by feeling with her hands. This was very frustrating for Helen, her mother, and her father. Helen Keller grew up in Alabama, USA, during the 1880s and 1890s. At that time, people who had lost the use of their eyes, ears, and mouth often ended up in charitable institutions. Such a place would provide them with basic food and shelter until they died, or they could go out on the street with a beggar's bowl and ask strangers for money. Since Helen's parents were not poor, she did not have to do either of these things. But her parents knew they would have to do something to help her. One day, when she was six years old, Helen became frustrated that her mother was spending so much time with the new baby. Unable to express her anger, Helen tipped over the baby's crib, nearly injuring the baby. Her parents were horrified and decided to take the last chance open to them. They would try to find someone to teach Helen to communicate. A new school in Boston claimed to be able to teach children like Helen. The Kellers wrote a letter to the school in Boston asking for help. In March of 1887, a teacher, 20-year-old Ann Sullivan, arrived at the Kellers' home in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Ann Sullivan herself had a very difficult life. Her mother had died when she was eight. Two years later, their father had abandoned Ann and their little brother Jimmy. Ann was nearly blind, and her brother had a diseased hip, 
No one wanted the two handicapped children, so they were sent to a charitable institution. Jimmy died there. At age fourteen, Anne, who was not quite blind, was sent to the school for the blind in Boston. Since she had not had any schooling before, she had to start in grade one. Then she had an operation that gave back some of her eyesight. Since Anne knew what it was like to be blind, she was a sympathetic teacher. Before Anne could teach Helen anything, she had to get her attention, because Helen was so hard to communicate with. She was often left alone to do as she pleased. A few days after she arrived, Anne insisted that Helen learn to sit down at the table and eat breakfast properly. Anne told the Kellers to leave, and she spent all morning in the breakfast room with Helen. Finally, after a difficult struggle, she got the little girl to sit at the table and use a knife and fork. Since the Keller family did not like to be strict with Helen, Anne decided that she needed to be alone with her for a while. There was a little cottage away from the big house. The teacher and pupil moved there for some weeks. It was here that Anne taught Helen the manual alphabet. This was a system of sign language, but since Helen couldn't see, Anne had to make the signs in her hands so she could feel them. For a long time, Helen had no idea what the words she was learning meant. She learned words like box and cat, but hadn't learned that they referred to those objects. One day, Anne dragged Helen to a water pump and made the signs for water, while she pumped water over Helen's hands. Helen at last made the connection between the signs and the thing. Water was that cool, wet, liquid stuff. Once Helen realized that the manual alphabet could be used to name things, she ran around naming everything. Before too long, she began to make sentences using the manual alphabet. She also learned to read and write using the square hand alphabet, which was made up of raised square letters. Before long, she was also using Braille and beginning to read books. Helen eventually learned to speak a little, although this was hard for her because she couldn't hear herself. She went on to school and then to Radcliffe College. She wrote articles and books, gave lectures, and worked tirelessly to help the blind. The little girl who couldn't communicate with anyone became, in time, a wonderful communicator. A favorite place. It is good to have a favorite place. Where you can go to be alone and relax. Sometimes this spot is your own room or a quiet part of the house. Sometimes it is somewhere outdoors, away from people and busy streets. Or you may feel most comfortable in a shopping mall or a downtown park. Our favorite place is especially nice to go at times of stress, when work gets too hectic, or we have trouble with other people. Then our favorite place is a refuge from these difficulties. My special spot is very close to where I work. It is on a busy university campus. At one end of the university, hidden among several buildings, there is a pond. This pond is surrounded by large rocks, which rise up like a small cliff on one side. Shooting out of these rocks are water pipes, which create a small waterfall. The water is drawn up from the bottom of the pond and drops back into the middle. This keeps the water from becoming stagnant. On the other side of the pond, there is a grassy shore and a flat stone patio. Here, in the summer, people can sit out and have meals. Yet, very few people come here to sit, perhaps because they are very busy with their work. There is something very calm and pleasant about trees and grass and shade, about birds singing and water rippling, and flowers blooming all around. Green is a relaxing color for the eyes. Still water suggests peace. Running water seems full of life. There is a large weeping willow tree on the grassy side of the pond. Its branches touch the water and shade much of the pond. Rushes grow in the shallow water. The pond is only about three feet deep. In the summer, there are beautiful water lilies in bloom over much of the pond. 
Sometimes I have counted over thirty blooms, and some flowers are over five inches wide. Goldfish and minnows are the pond's chief inhabitants, but there are also crayfish and other animals. At different times, there have been a turtle, a water snake, and a family of ducks. Behind the pond is a large glassy wall, which reflects the entire scene. One can also go inside and view the pond, even on rainy or snowy days. There are several gardens close to the pond. One of the gardeners told me that he could turn the waterfall off and on. Usually on the weekends, it is turned off. But if there is a special event, the waterfall is left on. Behind the glassy wall is a cafeteria. Here, visitors to the university are sometimes taken for meals. The students do not use it. In the winter, the pond freezes over. Sometimes, if the winter is very cold, the pond freezes right down to the bottom. Then, most of the goldfish and minnows die. Usually, some survive in the mud at the bottom of the pond. Occasionally, people will skate on the pond if the ice is smooth. When spring comes, a lot of the old rushes and water lily leaves from the previous year are cleared away. This makes the pond more attractive and gives the new plants room to grow. If there are too many rushes, they are sometimes cut down in summer. Then visitors can see the water lilies better. Chances are that if you ever visit Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, you will hear about Pond Inlet. And if you come in the summer, you will probably see me there, thinking about my next article. Business ethics. What do business and ethics have to do with each other? Business is about making profits. Ethics is about right and wrong. How are they connected? Well. Business ethics is the study of right and wrong as applied to business actions. Some businessmen would say that there is no need for business ethics. If we don't break the laws of the country, we have nothing to worry about. However, we can do many bad things without breaking laws. In some countries, it would be legal for a businessman to pollute the land, sea, and air. To confine his workers to barracks and to hire children to work in factories, but these things may not be right. On the other hand, it may be illegal for a businessman to do some good things. For example, his society may expect him to treat people unequally and discriminate against some ethnic or religious groups. In order to know what is right or wrong, we need a moral rule. This rule does not come from business itself. But from ethics, so we need a statement of what we believe to be right. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 states an ethical principle: We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The Declaration further tells us that all men have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Principles such as these can be used in American politics and law to decide whether an action is right or wrong. Many companies have their own ethical guidelines. IBM, for example, outlines its corporate ethics under headings such as tips, gifts, and entertainment, accurate reporting, fair competition, and not boasting. So each employee knows what to do or not to do in various situations. Ethical choices are made on three levels. Individuals, by companies and by societies, make them. An individual might choose whether or not to accept a bribe. A company might decide whether or not to bribe government officials. A government or society might decide whether or not to outlaw bribery. Similar principles of right and wrong might be used at all three levels. For example, it might be decided that bribery is simply wrong in all situations. On the other hand, it might be decided to view the situation case by case. In other words, there is a strong ethical stand and a more tentative ethical stand. 
The strong ethical stand applies when you have a basic moral principle and apply it to all situations. For example, you might believe that it was always wrong to let workers handle hazardous substances without any protection. The weaker stand would consider whether it is legal to do so. If it is legal to let workers handle dangerous materials, and this conforms to social expectations, then the weak ethical stand would say, no problem. As long as the law is not broken and no one strenuously objects, then everything is okay. However, in ethics, there is a principle called the moral minimum. This principle means that you should never harm another person knowingly. The only exception would be to protect some other people or yourself. So business ethics would say that the businessman who exposes his workers to hazardous chemicals is wrong. He is not practicing the moral minimum. Colonial Williamsburg Travelers in the desert or the jungle sometimes see the remains of old cities. These cities were once large and prosperous, but something has changed. Perhaps the climate got drier or wetter. Perhaps the trade routes, which had brought merchants to the city, now went elsewhere. Perhaps enemies destroyed them. Or perhaps disease or famine drove the people away. Other cities, which were once important, have become less so in time. Jamestown, Virginia, the first English colony in America, is now only an historic site. It began as the capital of Virginia, but when fire destroyed the government buildings in 1699, the capital was moved to nearby Williamsburg. Williamsburg was an important town for many years. The British governors lived there, and two of them worked on the plans for the town and its buildings. The College of William and Mary was established there in the 1690s the second oldest college in America. As the capital, Williamsburg contained many public buildings, including a courthouse, a jail, a powder magazine, the governor's palace, and the government building. Of course, there were many private houses as well. From 1699 until 1780, Williamsburg was the capital of Virginia. Many people came there for government and legal business. It was also a social center with dances, fairs, horse races, and auctions. The governor and his wife provided expensive dinners and entertainment for their guests. Most of the important people in Virginia owned tobacco plantations. In 1612, John Rolfe had first raised tobacco to sell to England. Soon, tobacco farming was Virginia's most important business. Most planters were able to build large houses and buy slaves to do their work. One plantation owner is said to have owned 300,000 acres of land and 1,000 black slaves, as well as having large amounts of money. The planters were the leaders of this colonial society, and they resented British interference in their local government. When England imposed taxes on the American colonists in 1765, it was a Virginian, Patrick Henry, who spoke against them. His words, Give me liberty or give me death, helped to inspire the American Revolution. As complaints about British rule increased, it was Virginians who led the rebels. George Washington became commander of the Revolutionary Army, and Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence in 1776. In 1780, the capital of Virginia was moved to Richmond. Williamsburg was now simply a small college town of local importance. Not much changed in Williamsburg for many years. In the 20th century, the Reverend Dr. Goodwin, who was the priest at the Williamsburg Church, had the idea of restoring Williamsburg to the way it appeared in colonial days. Goodwin approached John D. Rockefeller Jr. with his idea, and Rockefeller agreed to finance this project. Beginning in 1926, the old buildings of Williamsburg were restored to their original form. First were the college buildings, then the Rally Tavern, the government building, the governor's palace, and so on. 
Buildings that had been destroyed over time were reconstructed from plans and descriptions. Soon the restored buildings were open to the public. Guides, dressed in 18th century costumes, show visitors through the buildings and gardens. Visitors can also travel to nearby tobacco plantations. Now, tourists who pay admission to visit this wonderful historic town finance much of the work of restoration and conservation. Niagara on the Lake Niagara on the Lake is a little town at the mouth of the Niagara River. It is only 12 miles north of Niagara Falls. It used to be true that very few tourists would bother to travel from the falls down to Niagara on the Lake. Nowadays, however, the little town itself is a major tourist attraction. The town has a remarkable history. The area played an important role in both the American Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. As a result, the little town has two forts, Fort George and Fort Mississauga. When Fort George was reconstructed for the public in the 1930s, Niagara-on-the-Lake got its first big tourist attraction. Because Niagara-on-the-Lake was the first capital of Ontario, it has many significant firsts. There was the first parliament in the province, the first legal society, the first library, the first newspaper, the first museum building, and many more firsts. Besides its history, the town, which is bordered by Lake Ontario and the Niagara River, has beautiful scenery. On a summer's day, visitors can watch the sailboats going out the river to the lake. On the land side, Niagara is part of the fruit belt of Ontario. Peaches, pears, apples, cherries, and strawberries grow here in abundance. There are also long rows of vines, and winemaking has recently become a major industry. The mild, humid climate allows plants to flourish. The trees, especially the oaks, grow to remarkable heights. Flowering trees and shrubs perfume the air in the spring. Gardens are often spectacular for much of the year. Because of this, Niagara-on-the-Lake attracts many painters and photographers. Many of the private homes also have a long history, and great care is taken to keep them looking their best. The biggest single attraction is the Shaw Festival Theatre. The festival was founded in 1962 by a group of Shaw enthusiasts. Early productions were often held in the historic courthouse on the main street, and plays still take place there. In 1973, however, a new 861-seat Shaw Theatre was built at the south end of town. Since then, traffic to Niagara-on-the-Lake has been steady all through the long summer season. In 1996, Niagara-on-the-Lake was voted the prettiest town in Canada. Partly, it is the scale of things that makes the old town so attractive. The old town is only about eight blocks long by eight blocks wide. It has a population of little more than 1,000 people. Nonetheless, there is a lot for people to do and see. There are many interesting shops, old hotels, bookstores, art galleries, museums, a golf course, a marina, historic churches and cemeteries, several parks, three theaters, and lots of restaurants. Because it is small, Niagara-on-the-Lake is a good place to walk around or bicycle around. There are also horse and wagon rides. Although the main street can be hectic in tourist season, one doesn't have to go far off the main street to get in touch with an older, slower time. Most of the downtown buildings haven't changed much since the days of Queen Victoria, and tourists can still imagine that they are back in the days before computers and television.